but uh, I don't have to tell the world that these solutions exist, but the world already knows, and these are mainstream to the extent that uh, it's no more a new conversation. Uh, people are not getting excited just because you and I are having this conversation that okay, there are these possibilities. People already know, are aware, these possibilities are thriving, and uh, in fact, people should be asking very actively why the mustard seeds that are growing in my village are not getting processed here instead of those going into an urban area and then getting processed and coming back to me as mustard oil. So just reimagining that, because power not being reliable was a constraint, but now with DRE, with distributed renewables, that constraint is solved. Can we reimagine just the structures of the economy that we created and create many more local loops, inclusive loops, more value addition, closer to rural areas, not just in theory, but already happening in practice. Welcome to the section of Sustainability Karma. I'm your host Rajiv Diku. Today we have a very special guest with us, Abhishek Jain, who is Director of Green Economy and Impact Innovation at Council for Energy, Environment and Water. Welcome, Abhishek Jain, to the section of Sustainability Karma. Thank you, Rajiv. My pleasure. We're currently leading an initiative called Powering Livelihoods. Please tell us more about it. Powering Livelihood, uh, just as the two terms itself suggest, is literally powering, that is energizing through clean energy, livelihoods in peri-urban, in rural areas. We have been looking at various kinds of clean technology-based livelihood solutions. Imagine things like a waste biomass powered cold storage helping a farmer producer organization extend the shelf life of their lemons so that they can increase their income. Imagine cold storage uh, being run on solar uh, and helping a set of women improve their income. Imagine a solar powered hydroponics unit which is helping you grow fresh green fodder for your animal in the rural area in semi-arid dry conditions where green fodder is a huge issue. Imagine clean energy powered spinning machine which is reeling silk from coon to yam and helping reduce the drudgery for women who otherwise used to do thigh healing. So these are just few examples that I'm telling you, but there are 20 odd technologies that which we have been directly working to help improve the incomes at the first mile. I believe the foundation of this initiative seems to be decentralized renewable energy or DRE. How do the two realize? in the last 15-20 years have really made it possible that we can actually generate energy where we need it rather than necessarily that energy coming from thermal power plants sitting thousands of miles away and then you have the wires which are bringing the electricity to you. At the point of use, whether it is in the farm, whether it is next to the household, we can generate this energy through the solar rooftop systems. We have now seen them becoming ubiquitous even in urban areas or even through biomass and through small uh, hydro or wind. But of course solar is way more popular because of its ubiquity. So you're able to generate the energy very you need it and it is all renewable because it is coming from one or the other renewable energy sources and you're able to utilize it in the time of the day when you need it so this has just opened up a new gamut of possibilities whether it is for livelihoods whether it is for household use whether it is for community use whether it is healthcare education distributed renewables in a way becoming a new form of generating and delivering energy in some ways i think the future would be a lot more distributed and decentralized where uh, locally people are able to even trade energy if you are generating more and your neighbor is needing it they're actually able to trade that energy. So it's a future which is going to be both digitized but also decentralized and of course decarbonized. Thank you for sharing some examples. Would you like to share one detailed example of the cooling system? At one end you need uh, uh, any of these technologies, let's say solar panels, there are enough private suppliers nowadays in the market that you can buy and get technology installed on your rooftop or on your commercial establishment where it may be. At other end, you would need, if you're a livelihood enterprise, let's say a micro enterprise in a rural area, you would either you're already doing something, let's say you are running an atta chakki, like a floor mill, and right now it was dependent on diesel because power was unreliable and so on and so forth. And you can now replace that diesel with this solar power and completely generate clean energy to run your operations. In the process can also improve the efficiency of your machine because you have now reliable power, otherwise there was unreliable power. And you're able to save your input cost because your diesel costs are skyrocketing with the price of the fuel. Uh, and you're able to do better for the environment as well as your own pocket. So that's how this system works. But there are a lot of solution providers now emerging which are giving you integrated solutions. So instead of just a rooftop solar, you're actually getting the complete package of that floor mill along with the rooftop solar optimized for each other so that your costs come down both in terms of the capex as well as opex we are seeing many such solutions and those are the kind of solutions we have been supporting whether it is solar refrigerator for a kriana store or a fishery outlet solar powered loom for weaving uh, outlets whether it is solar powered tires for drying the horticulture produce whether it is tomatoes whether it is flowers into their dried variants and then you tend their value as well as shelf life so those are the kind of solutions that are emerging and are helping improve incomes at the, on the ground what is the kind of business opportunity we have here we see that the collective market for these solutions is 
close to about 50 billion US dollar or that's a billion with a b and it can impact close to 37 million livelihoods in india and this is only the livelihoods that are likely possible today and i think the opportunities are only going to grow even more as we go forward and this really enables one additional diversification of income which is necessary in the rural context a lot of dependence on primary produce like agriculture and then labor in the rural area which means that the economic opportunities for value addition are very limited and this really helps create more economic opportunities more value addition opportunities closer to where people are rather than people migrating to the cities so we see a huge opportunity here some of the technologies like green fodder has an annual market of 4 billion dollar in this country there is that much shortage of green fodder and these solutions which hardly take any land footprint because otherwise fodder is competing with your food crops now you do not even need any land just in the courtyard of your house you can put this vertical station and start producing fodder for four animals with a mere investment of 40000 rupees so it's cost effective it improves the yield of the milk for the animal it improves the animal health farmer also realize the benefit fairly quickly so that's the kind of economic opportunity we're talking about since we're talking about decentralized solutions i would presume the challenges would be also decentralized for you addressing these at the end of the day we are talking about technology technology means that it would need some kind of maintenance some kind of after sales support and so on and that is one area where we are intensively working with the manufacturers and deployers of these technologies with the community so some models that are emerging is each technology provider for example let's say a solar refrigerator manufacturer and your refrigerators will get deployed in different parts of uh, rural india but in one village you may not be deploying more than four to five such refrigerators right so it's very hard for you to get a repair guy or a women stationed there to just repair these refrigerators as and when something happens similarly an atta chakki how many solar powered atta chakki can you deploy in a village maybe one or two and so on so if each of these enterprises were to solve for the repair on their own it becomes very cost prohibitive it will not make sense economically but what we are trying to do is platformize if the 20 of such technologies are being deployed in one area can we have one repair person trained in that village and the sh- cost gets shared because we are creating a layer of distribution channel partner so person who is actually deploying all of these different solutions or an organization deploying all of these different solutions and working with these ben- vendors at the background so now they can afford to have that one person uh, sitting there because there is now enough number of solutions deployed out there uh, but similarly we are also trying to work with local technicians so you can train some a local electrician in the area to also become the after sales service agent for these uh, so you create additional jobs additional income opportunities also these are the bit of things where it's a little bit of chicken and egg without deployments you're not going to create enough after sales support and without a good after sales support you do not create the confidence among the buyers that yes this will be working and that is where we are trying to come in a program like ours powering livelihood has been trying to solve for these ecosystem level challenges it's a challenge which neither the user can solve on their own neither an enterprise can solve but if we come in and play that coordinating layer for the lack of a better word to solve for these ecosystem gaps that really helps move the entire system forward and over the last 4 4 and a half years we have managed to enable and support almost 32000 livelihood through these kind of solutions through our own program there are many more which have then happened on the background of it or mature or technologies in the first place they are fairly mature like many of these technologies have been around for 7 8 years uh, because when they came into our program they were couple of year old technologies and uh, their price points have stabilized uh, over the years after sales service issues have minimized over the years so they are really commercial technologies these are not like in the lab early pilots we are only working with technologies which are commercially available viable and have been deployed at scale so as i said like some of these technologies have already been deployed in thousands not even hundreds so they are reasonably mature uh, but yes very limited number of people i'm sure like even you may have not come across many of them or many of our listeners may have not come across these solutions in the past the awareness levels are very limited even among the users who potentially need these technologies but also the rest of the ecosystem players whether it is a financier or a banker who needs to ultimately sort of sanction a loan for a product like this or, or whether it is a rural distribution channel partners who we are now bringing them on board and exposing them to these technologies otherwise they are only selling fmcg goods so small retail stuff awareness is a big gap whether it is with the users whether it is with the distribution channels whether it is with the bankers and whether it is with policy makers so we've been also trying to sensitize policy makers in the last few years what is the potential of these technologies what is the impact that they can create on the ground and can help you solve multiple things can help you solve some of the environmental issues some of the livelihood and jobs issues some of the out migration issues some of the rural economy issues so yeah, it really ticks many boxes so what how does this ecosystem approach link up with financial institutions and banks if i were to explain it a little candidly for many of these renewable powered technologies you are actually paying for the next 20 25 years of electricity on day zero which means that the capital cost or the capex of these technologies can be high
higher than what you would otherwise find in the market let's say a regular refrigerator running on electricity versus a solar refrigerator there will be a easily 3x 4x kind of a difference the user cannot pay for these technologies up front from their pocket we are also talking about rural consumers here farmers and so on so the role of financing is very critical in enabling the adoption of these technologies and we have had interesting success stories we work with some of the nbfcs the non banking financial companies because they are usually a little bit more agile and nimble compared to banks and also a little bit more risk taker we have been working with some of them to unlock loans and now we have a cumulatively almost 2 crore loan facility 1 crore loan facility has already been deployed completely with the users and has been circulated back so it means that the repayments have happened and the next set of users have got that money and we have also unlocked additional 1 crore this is just for one technology this is for solar refrigerators we have managed to unlock this very very promising to see that the npa the non performing assets in this case have been less than 3% so most of those users have been able to pay back and the next set of users have been able to get the technology uh, but we have also unlocked interesting things like with p2p platforms peer to peer lending and investment platforms as you may have come across we launched the first fund of its kind on distributed renewable energy based livelihoods to be promoted through one of those platforms called rangde retail investors uh, like you and i can actually go on the platform and actually fund such a technology for an end user sitting in any part of the rural india and the end user gets the loan at a very affordable loan rates of 6 to 8% for adopting such solutions we have also managed to unlock in some cases the uh, government schemes there are schemes like pm fme for micro food processing uh, in the rural area so for some of our technologies we have managed to unlock the government schemes whether it is little bit of upfront capital subsidy whether it is a interest subvention linked loan so those are the ways in which we have been trying to unlock this uh, even as part of our powering livelihoods program what have been the learnings over the last year that could be used for scaling up i think the learning is that we must need take a ecosystem level approach we can't just solve for okay this looks like one good technology let's say a solar charkha let's just only focus on solar charkha this is like cold storages are needed in the farms let's just only focus on cold storage that doesn't work it will lead some isolated success stories at best but it, it will not solve for creating completely privately managed ecosystem on its own because these end up getting dependent on one scheme or the other but if you are really trying to solve for this to become a mature industry on its own and scale up we really need a ecosystem approach which means that we solve for the awareness challenge with each of those actors as i said from end user to channel partners to financiers and policy makers right now why the transaction is not happening solving for those reasons so like in some cases it is just the risk perception like a financier if they are not aware of the technology they don't know how to evaluate a loan application around it so there are those capacity gaps so we are now trying to make even financial toolkits and tools for bankers that okay if a loan application comes to you for a solar powered silk drilling machine how should you evaluate it how should you say whether it is viable or not viable making sure that wherever the transaction is not happening on its own what is it that we can do what is the structural gap that we need to solve so that it moves forward so we know now that awareness and capacity building of some of these actors is very critical to enable scale and the second thing is showcase them opportunity promise the stories on the ground already happening 32000 is not a small number that just our program has enabled uh, these are not like isolated one example here and there uh, and we are generating very systemic evidence that okay how many of these users are actually improving their income what is the extent of income improve they are seeing what is the extent of treasury reduction or social improvement in their lives that we are seeing so that we can use this data use this evidence in a structured way with policy makers with financiers like financiers want to see what is the kind of cash flows of your existing users before i come up with a financial product so generating that systemic evidence is really helping us unlock a lot of this so i would say like a lot of capacity building a lot of awareness generation evidence generation which can feed back into these systems so that we can scale these things up i think there's enough proof points we have created sizable proof points which can now be scaled up. what is the kind of buy in by policy makers we now in india has first policy a policy framework to promote decentralized renewable energy based livelihood solutions mnri came out with this policy a lot of background work we did with the ministry through our experience on the ground learning what is working what is not working in 2022 government of india came up with the first policy but we have not seen so far is the from policy to schemes as you know policies are directional so government has looking forward to schemes which can also support things on the ground and one thing we are trying to also actively help towards is enable convergence between multiple schemes of the government so there is a national rural livelihood mission which is supporting women shgs in the rural areas there is pm fme of ministry of food processing and industry which is supporting micro entrepreneurs pm matasya sampada yojana which is supporting fisheries each one of them are livelihood promotion schemes can we enable those livelihood promotion schemes to also start looking for clean tech based livelihood decentralized renewable energy based livelihood so that you are not just promoting livelihoods relevant for today but also livelihoods which are going to be resilient for tomorrow so we are trying to actively enable that we are getting interesting traction but we are still few miles to go gender is a concern oh you making your initiative
to get that inclusive very explicit you have a very explicit focus in the program to make it gender inclusive uh, and women face in each of the step whether it is from technology design itself many times if you are not thinking of your user to be a woman you may end up designing a technology which is not easily operatable by women right so from technology design aspect to the way you are generating awareness which channels are you going to use uh, are those channels accessible to women if you are doing awareness only through uh, social media are women accessing as many mobile phones as male members what other routes can you follow can you spread this message through the women self help group awareness generation channels is something we are we are trying to make them more inclusive when it comes to let's say even after interest is generated you need to apply for a loan women face more pronounced challenge when it comes to unlocking a loan compared to men one they will not have any existing collateral or asset in their name many a time so if a banker is asking for a collateral so we are now pushing for collateral free loans in these cases just like when you buy a two wheeler you do not need to actually give the papers of your land uh, to buy a two wheeler and get a loan can be also same for the livelihood solutions uh, especially the dre livelihood solutions so that then makes it more accessible for women to access the loans uh, and, and finally the mobility challenge the market linkage related issues let's say you are producing a value added product dried rose petals that can go into sweets that can go into other uses how do you go and connect it to the market so those market linkages are harder for women to crack than men and in those cases also we are working with our enterprises so some of our enterprises are not just giving you a tech solution like a solar dryer but they're also buying back the final produce from the women from the farmers so that user doesn't have to figure out the market and the enterprise is then selling that b2b into uh, other channels and so on those are the ways in which we are trying to make the program inclusive and in fact a large majority of our users close to 50% of our users are actually women so out of those 32000 livelihoods that we have impacted half of them are women finally what would you like to see in the next 5 years i would like to see that uh, i don't have to tell the world that these solutions exist that the world already knows and these are mainstream to the extent that uh, it's no more a new conversation uh, people are not getting excited just because you and i are having this conversation that okay there are these possibilities people already know are aware these possibilities are thriving and uh, in fact people should be asking very actively why the mustard seeds that are growing in my village are not getting processed here instead of those going into a urban area and then getting processed and coming back to me as mustard oil so just reimagining that because power not being reliable was a constraint but now with dre with distributed renewables that constraint is solved can we reimagine just the structures of the economy the way we created and create many more local loops inclusive loops more value addition closer to rural areas not just in theory but already happening in practice in the next 5 years thank you abhishek jain for sharing the kind of interesting work that's happening in some parts of the country thank you I hope you like this program we look forward to your feedback on our whatsapp number 9818120554 for participation in this program write to us at sustainability.karma@gmail.com looking forward to meet you again at the same time next week with a new episode and a new guest Till then goodbye from all of us Sustainability Karma A podcast series on sustainable development sustainability and ESG